Our lectionary New Testament reading for this fourth Sunday in Lent comes from Ephesians chapter 5. Listen to and for God's word this morning. For once you were in darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Walk then as children of the light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true trying to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. Rather, expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do secretly. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says... Sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This Lent, our preaching theme has been on being human. We began, if you went to one of our Ash Wednesday services, our Lenten journey with these words. Remember, it is from dust you have come, and to dust you will return. To be human is to be reminded that we are from the dust of the earth and to the dust we will return. In fact, etymologically, the word human comes from the word humus, dirt, soil, earth, or more specifically, according to Webster's dictionary, the organic components of soil formed by the decomposition of leaves and other plant material. When I read this, I thought, well, that's interesting. To be human is to be a creature made up of composted material. We are simply and humbly God-breathed dust Composted material made from the humus of leaves and plants in our ancestors. And to it we will return, contributing to the compost of other lives after our death. This reminder of our finite and temporary reality is humbling. It puts us in a right place with where we stand in this world before others and with God. Which brings us to our third word in this etymological grouping. Humans, humus, humble, of the earth. It is humbling to be human. We have limits. We make mistakes as Pastor Heather so beautifully spoke with the children. We don't know it all. We sin. We mess things up, we get hurt, we hurt others, and are humbled in our humanity. We are brought low to the earth, remembering it is from the earth that we came, and to the earth we will return. And humility, ironically, in that difficult and earthy place, that composting reality of our lives, is ironically the space of transformation in the spiritual journey. It's the place of freedom and liberation. Francisco de Asuna, a 15th century Spanish mystic, said, Humility is the root of every tree that bears fruit. Humility is the root of every tree that bears fruit. And I love this because healthy trees need rich hummus, composted material to grow and be fruitful. And so human beings need soil of humility to grow and be fruitful. A fruitful life in Christ is rooted in humbly admitting and owning the broken, fallen, difficult realities and struggles of our individual lives and our collective history together. Or as we will begin to mix our metaphors today, as Paul says in our scripture reading, bring everything into the light. 
even and perhaps especially the dark and shameful things that are done in secret so that it becomes visible in God's presence. And in that light, then its darkness is actually turned into light. There's an invitation here this morning from the Apostle Paul. Stop hiding. Stop living in the shadows. Humbly come into the light. Walk as children of the light. What keeps you hiding in the shadows? What keeps you from coming out of the paralyzing shadows of guilt and shame and fear and worry and anxiety about your life and entering into the calming, soothing light of God? Listen to these words from the late Brennan Manning as he reflects on this reality, this struggle for us as human beings to come into the light. Manning says, God is relentlessly tender and compassionate towards us just as we are. Not in spite of our sins and faults, that would be acceptance, but with them. God does not condone or sanction evil. God does not withhold love because there is evil in us or in the world. God calls us to come out of hiding and come openly. God weeps over us when shame and self-hatred immobilize us. The reason we never enter into the deepest reality of our relationship with God is that we seldom acknowledge our utter nothingness. God not only forgives and forgets our shameful deeds, but even turns their darkness into light. All things work together for those who love God. Even Augustine of Hippo added, our sins. Christians who remain in hiding continue to live a lie. We deny the reality of our sin. If we conceal our wounds out of fear and shame, our inner darkness can neither be illuminated nor become light for others. End quote. Friends, we are all from the humus of the earth. We are all human. And we have all at one moment or another been humbled as we've sat in the composted reality of our lives. Our failure to do the right thing. Our failure to speak up. The hurts that we've given to another. But here's the good news. Confession is liberation. God does not want or need us to strive to make change, to be better, to do more, to offer a sacrifice of our lives. God longs for us to come out of hiding and shame and fear. And as Billy so beautifully sang for us this morning, for you, O oh God, do not want sacrifice. You delight in our friendship with you. A sacrifice most appropriate is a humble spirit, a repentant and contrite heart. Is there anything in your life that perhaps Spirit is speaking in you even in this moment that you've done or that you've not done that's keeping you shackled and hiding in the dark shadows and fearing the light? How might God be inviting you in this middle of this Lenten season out of the shadows and into the light to humbly be broken and bring the truth of your life, the honest truth of your life into the light? of God. Friends, as we continue on this Lenten journey, as we continue in this time of transition as a church, let's illuminate the shadows. Let's walk as children of the light. Let's produce the fruit of light from the humble composted soil of our lives. The fruit of that light is pursuing what is good and right and true. Now, this is true for us as individual people, right? 
I think we can all think about something as the kids beautifully illustrated for us this morning, something we need to say we're sorry for, something that we've been holding that we need reconciliation for, but it's also true in our collective lives together here as a church. On Sunday, January 29th, 2023, Dr. Brock Baylor presented to about a hundred friends and members of ELPC some sobering and humbling facts about our church's history. Dr. Baylor reported on that day that in April of 1808, Jacob Negley, one of the original founders of ELPC, entered a contract with one Robert Spencer to purchase a portion of the land that our church is built on. And as the bill of the sale enumerates, Jacob Negley wrote, I, Jacob Negley, in consideration of the sum of $250, sold unto said Robert Spencer two Negro girls who are by birth servants to serve until they arrive at the age of 28 years. The one named Nell, who was born April 19th, 1786, and the other named Paul, born on April 21st, 1788. For $250, Jacob Negley sold Nell, age 22, and Paul, age 20, to be enslaved for another combined 14 years of unpaid labor to purchase the land upon which this church was built. Dr. Baylor, who's a friend of mine, told me that when he held the bill of sale in the basement of the Heinz History Museum, he had to set it down and leave the room for his inability to con control his sobbing. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them, because everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For everything that becomes visible is light. I want you to notice in this moment what is happening in your body in your mind, in your spirit, as you hear these words, perhaps a second time, perhaps for the first time. Just notice it, whether it's grief or shame or embarrassment or anger or you feel yourself shutting down, fight, flight, freeze. This reality of our church, this reality is in the light. What might it look like friends, to allow the painful truth of this story to become a light that humbles us, humus, humans, and leads us forward as a church. I have to admit to you this morning, you're supposed to stand in this pulpit with answers. I don't know that I have answers. I have a few ideas that, of course, I will share with you. But my friend David Bailey in his work with racial justice says this, history can be used to hurt, hide, or heal. For whatever reason, this history has been hidden from us until now. And now that this history is no longer hidden, how can we use this history to heal? Well, as I said, I have a few thoughts. First, let us lament and confess. I remember sitting in the back of the social hall that day and feeling paralyzed in my own being. Let us dwell in the darkness, the angst of the unjust economic exchange for the lives of our siblings, Nell and Paul. Let us weep and mourn and wail for them. Let us say to ourselves and to one another and to God that what happened was evil and sinful. Let it break our hearts and move us to that broken and contrite spirit that the psalmist speaks of. 
And for my fellow siblings here in this beautiful sanctuary today who are racialized as white people, this may mean the expression of emotions and tears and wailing, which white people are not very good at. We will not heal if we are divorced from our emotions. We're invited as predominantly white people to relinquish and repent of our perpetual Western positivity and progress and instead grieve and mourn, lament the truth of what is, sit in the unfixable soup of our own history. This is hard work. I admit that I am a person who likes to know that we're making progress, moving forward, achieving goals. Sometimes you just got to be with it. Secondly, let us allow for rage and anger in our midst. Rage and anger are powerful forces of transformation and liberation. Author and activist Valerie Kaur says, divine rage is fierce, disciplined, and visionary. And the aim of divine rage is not vengeance, but to reorder the world. It is precise and purposeful. Perhaps our task as human beings are to find safe containers for our raw, reactionary rage. And then choose to harness that energy in a way that creates a new world for all of us. Again, my siblings who are racialized as white, we need to recognize that our culturally Christianized niceness and civility often silences and disempowers the rage and anger of our BIPOC siblings. We need to learn that rage and anger is a God-given gift and a force of healing and justice and transformation that our BIPOC siblings can actually lead us in. And thirdly, let us seek repair. I found it interesting that the kids so easily went to repair. When they made a mistake, I get grounded, I lose my allowance, I got to make it right. This is interesting to me to listen to them this morning. Because I think somehow in the church we, we think saying I'm sorry is enough. But when the darkness is brought into the light, we, like the tiny little man Zacchaeus, we are invited to find our salvation by paying back, that's a quote from Scripture, those who we've sinned against. My friend Cole Arthur Riley says it this way, justice does not survive without repair. To expect repair without some kind of remittance would be injustice doubled. What is stolen must be returned. This is not vengeance. It is restoration. How do we as the body of Christ of East Liberty Presbyterian Church repair the stolen lives of Nell and Paul. I am grateful and ask for your continued prayer for our reparations ministry team and our session who are continuing to discern the next steps of what seeking reparations looks like. If you have the opportunity to come over here today and see the empty stained glass window of Stonewall Jackson, just blue glass, a reparation that we've already made. It is a stark, beautiful, and disturbing thing to gaze upon, to know that somehow that is wrapped up in our history. And it, for me, as I gaze upon it even now, it invites me to consider what does the future look like? How do we create a new path forward? I'm landing the plane. Let me close with this longer reflection from Cole Arthur Riley again. If you're like me, this idea, this word of reparations is new to my Christian journey. It is not something I grew up thinking about and understanding. And Cole asks a beautiful question and centers the idea of repair 
right in the center of our faith. It was helpful for me, and I hope it's helpful for you as well. She says, I've always wondered why Christ had to die. If we needed saving, if wrath has to be had, couldn't God just snap his fingers, send a great wink or just blink, and have everything wrong made right again? What is it about nothing but the blood, quoting the famous hymn? Nothing else? This was always strange to me. But if it's true, the law is cosmic and eternal. And maybe it's written into everything, and even God himself is not too bold to undo the way things were meant to be. Maybe God needed to show us what the most tragic and noble reparation could look like. The sacrifice of life itself. So we might learn the courage to choose to make repairs when our moment comes. I don't know where this lands with you this morning. I'll be honest. I didn't want to give this message. But when I read the lectionary text some weeks ago, I knew that I needed to speak of this. So I don't know how it's landing with you. But however it is landing with you, be with that. Sadness, anger, rage, hope, shutting down. Whatever it is present with you in this moment, I'm inviting you to turn it into prayer. How do you want to pray this morning? What do you want to say to God? What questions do you want to ask God? Where are you angry? In the middle of this Lenten season, it is appropriate for us to confess. It is appropriate for us to bring everything that's bubbling up and stirring in us in this moment into the light. For that is where our freedom and our liberation is. So in your bulletin, you have a couple prompts. We're going to sing and take some time to pray in writing, if that feels right to you. There's a little half sheet in there. And if those prompts are helpful for you, use them. If you just want to sit and stew, that's okay as well. But I will say that we know neurologically and biologically that putting pen to paper helps us process things. So stretch yourself if that feels like a strange exercise to do in church this morning. We will sing. And when, when and if you would like to, you may bring your prayers forward at any point during the service. Place them in the basket. We've put the baptismal font at the front as well to remind you that you are a child of the light. We are the children of the light. But I ask you once again, what do you need or want to confess, tell the truth, name, in the presence of God, the presence of yourself, and the presence of your siblings this morning? Let us move into a time of song and prayer together.